Welcome um, everyone to our third symposium in this symposium of virtual five by five with the title will already therapy be delivered in a maximum of five treatment fractions. This is as mentioned the third symposium we're having in this row here we have been discussing rectal cancer so far breast cancer and today obviously one highlight and um, prostate cancer will be discussed and I will give you a quick introduction into this topic. Hyperfractionation of prostate cancer. This is obviously one of the most extensively discussed and investigated clinical questions in radiation oncology. 10 randomized phase three trials have been conducted. They have long-term follow-up. A Cochrane meta-analysis has been performed with long-term follow-up of almost 10 years. And you can see here the summary of this Cochrane review, the number of trials which have been included for this endpoint the number of patients reaching more than 8,000, the certainty of evidence reaching from high to low, and the relative risk for overall survival, biochemical relapse, acute and late toxicity, all C1.0 or at least very close to 1.0, suggesting that the moderate hyperfractionation with fraction sizes up to 3.4 gray have similar oncological outcome compared to conventionally fractionated radiotherapy. And there is little to no increase in both acute and late toxicity. And this is obviously because of the different biology of prostate cancer compared to, for example, lung cancer or head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. The alpha beta ratio is indeed low if there is no effect of total treatment time very low of 1.2 gray. And even if we would assume some proliferation here, the alpha beta ratio would be in the order of magnitude of 2.7 gray, which is the rational for this benefit or the equivalence of hyperfractionation. And also the rational for even going to stronger hyperfractionation to an SBRT approach. Of course, evidence is one side, the implementation is the other one. I've shown similar data for breast cancer last week, a survey which has been conducted by ESTRO in 2018 and 2019, so before the pandemic, more than 2000 radiation oncologists answers. And you can see here the implementation of hyperfractionation for prostate cancer, for low risk prostate cancer, ranging between 20% and a maximum of 90%. And that goes down for intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer. Overall, the adoption of hyperfractionation was still only 60%. How about SBRT? This will be the topic of this symposium today. We have evidence speaking for this motion to implement SBRT approach. Randomized evidence, the Wittmark trial, seven fraction radiation, not really SBRT, but large patient numbers and an efficacy endpoint. We have pools of prospective phase two trials, large number of patients, sufficient follow-up, and we have toxicity data by the PACE trial, which will, I guess, be presented in detail by today. But is this evidence sufficient for clinical implementation? This is a question we would like to address and discuss today. Before we start with the symposium, I would like to ask you three questions and please answer them. They will now appear in the Zoom, so you will be able to answer the three of them. The first is obviously whether you have practiced S5 fraction SBRT in your clinical service for localized, let's say intermediate risk prostate cancer. Yes or no? The second question, what fractionation would you propose to a Gleason score seven good performance status, intermediate risk, 70-year-old prostate cancer patient, two of 12 biopsy cores positive, PSA below 10, single selection, either conventionally fractionated radiation in 74 to 80 gray, 37 to 40 fractions, 60 gray in 20 fractions, chip regimen, or an SBRT approach, 35 to 40 gray in five fractions. And then the same or similar question, in a high-risk patient, 68-year-old male, good performance status, high-risk prostate cancer, Gleason score 4 plus 4, 7 of 12 biopsy for course positive, PSA 20.35, localized disease in PSMA PET, um, 
Here you have a multiple selection. So you can choose one of these fractionations and you can in addition choose whether you would add whole pelvis radiation and whether you would add ADT. So I will give you some time to answer the question. We have a 66% of ha not having implemented SPRT for prostate cancer. So the majority of the audience um, is not, has not implemented in their clinical routine yet. The second question in terms of high uh, low risk, pro uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer case, there we have a predominance for CHIP with 44%, followed by um, conventionally fractionated radiotherapy by 30%, and the SBRT regimen with 26%. And then going to the high risk patient, there we have a strong preference in terms of fractionation for conventionally fractionated radiotherapy. 64%, then hyperfractionation tip with 28%, and SPIT only being selected by 5%. Whole pelvis radiotherapy would be added by 50% precisely, and the ADT would be added by 64%. So this is the bench line mark, which we will discuss and what we have as a background. With that, um, I, some housekeeping rules before. We want to make that an interactive seminar so you can ask questions using the questioning and answering functionality. The sessions will be recorded and all questions which will be asked will be answered and made available in a written form. And here is the um, QR code, so you just need to scan it and then you will be redirected to our, um, to our seminar homepage and both the presentations and the questions will be found. CME credits will be sent via email and please evaluate the symposium that will be possible mm. afterwards. I would also like to thank the endorsement by the Degro Society and Estra Society and the support by Varian and URA. And with that, I will have the pleasure to introduce today's speakers. The keynote speaker is Dr. Nicholas van Es from the Royal Marsden Hospital and Institute of Cancer Research UK. And the speaker panel will be completed by Professor Nikolaus Andratschke here from the University Hospital in Zurich. <clears throat> Professor Nikolaus von Aas is um, the medical director and clinical consultant of the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. He has been for many years a clinical oncologist in the urology unit at the Royal Marsden since 2008. And he's also the hospital's lead in stereotactic body radiotherapy and in the cyber knives service. He's chair of the UK SBRT consortium. His main research interests are stereotactic and image guided radiotherapy, risk prediction in early prostate cancer and functional MRI imaging. And what makes him in particular valuable for this symposium, he's chief investigator of the PACE trial and international randomized control trial comparing SBRT and image guided radiotherapy and surgery for treating prostate cancer. Nick, many thanks for joining. We're looking forward to your presentation and in particular for discussing your presentation afterwards. Nick, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for the invite. Um, as I say, I had a few um, breakups in my signal while you were speaking. So I hope that doesn't happen while I'm speaking, but let me know if it's my signal that's causing the problem. Thanks for the invitation. I was asked to, to talk on from 40 to five fractions and I've, I've added whether we can possibly maybe even go beyond that. Um, those are my disclosures. So a bit of background. So fractionation in prostate cancer remains a, a, an evolving story. And in my view, there is still some distance to travel on, on, this, on this story. But in fact, hyperfractionation is not new. And particularly in the UK, um, hyperfractionation has been used really for convenience. Um, and in some places, lack of, of resource for many years. So in parts of the north of England, almost all cancers were treated within three weeks. So radiotherapy regimes were structured around a three week regime. And even at the Marsden, we've been using a 36 in six gray fractionation for many years in, in our more elderly patients who are a bit more frail and we don't feel will tolerate a full course of radical treatment. And 36 in six has given very good and durable local control. So, the concept of, of hyperfractionation is not new. But what has changed? Well, radiotherapy has been a continually evolving technology and the hardware 
and the software that, that we have available to us has allowed us to transform the way we deliver radiotherapy from when I started when conformal radiotherapy was coming in to becoming routine practice and then fairly rapidly IMRT evolved and then ARC therapies with VMAT and, and now um, SPRT technologies. So the, the, tech, the way we deliver radiation has changed significantly. And we have all these fancy machines like the CyberKnife and uh, the Varian Trivium, which is, can, can deliver um, VMAT or rapid arc therapy track machines. And this is the new kit on the block, um, the Elector Unity machine, one of the MR Linux, um, where you have both on the same gantry a MRI scanner and a linear accelerator mounted um, together so that you can get real time MR imaging and deliver radiation. And so this is a machine that we now have at the Marsden and are evaluating in, in some clinical trials. So these technologies have allowed us to think differently about how we deliver radiation. to the target so we can hyperfractionate to significantly larger doses than we've moving from 1.8 to 3 gray for instance um, but moving from from 3 gray right up to to 6 and 7 and 7 gray and beyond but just because we can do this uh, does it actually justify it is there a sound rationale for doing hyperfractionation I was reminded of this quote by, by Mark Twain, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And it, is this just us wanting to play with our toys and allowing us to do fancy radiotherapy or is there a sound reason to do it? So as Matthias uh, mentioned that we, the alpha beta ratio for prostate cancer would seem very favorable to the, for this. So a reminder, I think we have some um, non-clinical oncologists in the audience that the aim here is that we increase the dose to the target whilst not increasing the toxicity. So we want to create, uh, widen what's called a therapeutic window where we can, we can treat the cancer without doing harm. And there are lots of um, papers that have looked at what the presumed alpha beta ratio is. And although we can't be entirely sure exactly where it is, probably within the fractionation times we use, it's between 1.5 and 1.8 uh, gray. Um, And that's, this is just an example of some of the different alpha betas that have been calculated. You can see within there, there are some wide ranges, um, but most of them have suggested that the alpha beta ratio is somewhere between 1.5 and 1.8. So this in principle allows us to do dose escalation, which I call dose escalation by stealth. So instead of just giving a higher total dose, we give a lower total dose, but a higher biological effect by hyperfractionating. And we, if we look how this calculates, so conventionally fractionated radiotherapy given in two gray per fraction, so a 78 gray regime. If the alpha beta ratio is 1.5, the BED is 1H2. For the Vidmark regime, which I'll discuss a bit later, which is a seven fraction regime, if the alpha beta ratio is 1.5, the BED is 216 gray. And for 36.25 gray, which is what we give. Nick. We might have lost you. Well, there are four very large randomized trials of moderate hyperfractionation. And as Matthias mentioned, there's a, there's a large meta-analysis and Cochrane review. But I'm just going to talk about the largest of these randomized studies. So the four large ones are the CHIP study from the UK, the PROFIT study from Canada, um, and the RTOG0415 from the USA, and the HIPRO study from the Netherlands. So the largest of these is the CHIP study, which was led by my uh, um, friend and mentor, David Durnley, who's recently retired. But a standard re regimen, 60 gray, um, which was one of the experimental regimes and 57 gray. Okay, there were 3000, and now it's telling me the Okay. All right, sorry, um, so really sorry. I apologize to everyone for the internet problems. So this was the um, acute, sorry, uh, the, I think we missed this. So the, the results of the CHIP study showed that the 60 gray experimental arm was non-inferior to the 74 gray, um, but the 57 gray was not non-inferior. Right. Got it? Matthias, did you stop me? 
Yes, I can see you now, but we... Now it works. Okay. Okay, so okay. let's continue. Okay. Okay. So as I said, the 60 gray was shown to be non-inferior, whereas the 57 gray was not non-inferior to the 74 gray. And the acute toxicity, the top line represents grade one toxicity. The blue was the control arm and the green and the red were the two experimental arms. You can see that the toxicity came on, this is for bowel, a little bit earlier, um, peaked a little higher, but then came back to a very similar baseline. Similarly with the grade two for bowel, peaked a little higher, a little earlier, um, but came back to the same baseline. Whereas with bladder, the peak was a bit earlier, but at the same height, um, and again, normalized to the same, and similarly with the grade two. In terms of the late toxicity, this is the bowel toxicity. So at two years, you can see low rates of grade one and two toxicity, and very, very low rates of grade three toxicity. And this actually continued to improve out to five years. And for the bladder, very importantly, if you look at the pre-radiotherapy, was in fact higher rates of bladder symptoms at the pre-radiotherapy than there was at both two and five years, and just shows how important it is to do baseline toxicity when you're doing a large randomized trial. So what about SVRT? Can we go to three gray fractions and above? Can we go above three gray fractions? Sorry. So if we look again at the table I showed you earlier, just a reminder of what the BED is um, for, for 36.25 gray. In the PACE study, we give that dose to the PTV and to the CTV, we give 40 gray in five fractions, which gives us a BED to the, to the um, CTV of 253 gray. Well, for many years, a lot of the data on SBRT came from single center, largely cyber knife uh, driven um, treatment platforms and, and, and centers with small numbers of patients and single centers. So in 2013, when we kind of, we were sort of getting into this, um, the, the level of evidence was fairly low. Um, people, there were a lot of pioneers, a lot of familiar names, Deb Freeman, and Alan Katz, and a lot of people who were pioneers of SBRT published data early, but there were small numbers and, and, low, and all single center. But this group of, of, of pioneers then also put their data together um, and they pooled their analysis um, and so, so they started to group the numbers. But the problems with it, it was still retrospective. Um, there, was not, there wasn't really reliable um, toxicity collections. They did report health-related quality of life, but a lot, a lot of this was done retrospectively. And I think, you know, we've learned from many studies that unless you actually prospectively collect um, data, you don't get an accurate reflection of acute toxicity or late toxicity. But the outcomes in terms of the disease were extremely encouraging. So for low and intermediate risk disease, we're getting 95 and 84% control rates. These patients were largely treated without hormonal therapy. For high risk disease, not surprisingly, these control rates fell off. Um, but again, a lot of these patients with high risk disease did not have hormonal therapy. And this data led to ASTRO forming the opinion that the data for SBRT had matured to a point where it could be considered as an alternative treatment for low and intermediate risk disease. I have to say at the time I was quite surprised because there was no level one evidence, but yet this has been the ASTRO's position now for a number of years. However, the, the, there are some multi-center um, studies with good prospective data collection. So this was a study by Bob Meyer um, again, this was CyberKnife data, but with, it, the difference was it was multi-center and prospectively designed. So all the, all the toxicity data was collected at baseline and then at set time points. So a much truer reflection of, of, the, of, the, of the data. The five-year control rates were fantastic, PSS of, PFS of 97.1%, and again, very encouraging toxicity results. So these were the control, the, the overall survival, disease-free survival um, across the low and intermediate risk disease. And you can just see these are in the high 90s for both groups. So very, very encouraging data. There were two prospective studies. One was Bob Meyer, one was um, Don Fuller. They were slightly different in the way they were designed. The, the Bob Meyer study, patients were played with five fractions and heterogeneous um, planning technique. Um, and the, the uh, sorry, homogeneous planning technique. And Alan, uh, Don Fuller had the 
heterogeneous planning technique in four fractions, but they pooled their data and again showed very, very good control rates in the low um, and the favorable intermediate risks, less favorable in the high risk, but there was no ADT in these patients. So I don't think this is surprising as we know the benefit of ADT in high risk prostate cancer. There's a recent large uh, meta-analysis of 6, 000, over 6,000 men um, from Jackson et al. in the Red Journal, um, and, and again, looks at very similar figures. So I think we can be fairly confident that SPRT is going to give us high levels of disease control, particularly in the low and the favorable intermediate risk population. But we do still lack randomized data. So the closest we have to an SPRT randomized study is a Spidmark study, the HIPO study, um, which is actually seven fractions and compared 42.7 gray and seven fractions to the then standard 78 gray. And this study was just planned with conformal radiotherapy. There was no particular fancy image guidance or IMRT. Um, and again, you can see those lines almost completely overlap. There was no difference between the disease outcomes with about 80% control rates at five years. In terms of toxicity, there was a moderate increase for the ultra, ultra, ultra hyperfractionation in bowel toxicity, um, which came at the end of treatment, um, but then very rapidly uh, got the, the, the lines again overlap and no difference right out to eight and 10 years. And similarly with urinary toxicity, slightly higher urinary toxicity, but again, in very close to overlapping lines right out now to long-term follow-up of eight and 10 years. So we now come to the PACE trial, which is a study which uh, we, we've been running in the UK um, and, and Canada. And this is a randomized study comparing stereotactic body radiotherapy to both surgery and to image-guided image radiotherapy. And effectively, there are three different arms to the study. We started as a cyber knife only study, but then it evolved to being multi-platform. And now there are significantly more patients who've been treated on linear accelerators than treated on a cyber knife. So this is what the study looked like, looks like. This is for PACE um, A and B. So patients with early stage prostate cancer, T1C to T2C, Gleason 3 plus 4, so not 4 plus 3s. PSA less than 20. If surgery is their um, desired treatment, they can randomize within the PACE trial, PACE A trial, to prostatectomy or to SBRT, and we're aiming for 117 patients in each arm of that study. And this study is still recruiting and I'll show you where we are with it in a minute. The PACE B study was comparing SBRT, 36.25 grain, five fractions, to when we started, it was 78 grain, 39 fractions. Although most centers switched over to a, four, a 20 fraction regime after the publication of the profit and the CHIP studies, there was no hormones in PACE and therefore there was a slightly higher dose in the 60 gray given the, the lack of hormonal therapy. So these are just the more, the more detail on the eligibility criteria, but essentially it's the, the low and the favored intermediate, favorable intermediate risk patients. Essentially, it's largely a study of intermediate, intermediate risk disease because in the UK, almost all low risk patients are managed with active surveillance. So we have published and, and looked at the acute toxicity results so there were 874 patients with localized prostate cancer in phase B, um, and no one got ADT. Almost all patients were MRI staged, and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to these two regimes. And we've published the, both the physician-reported toxicity and the patient-reported outcome. We also now have the PACE C trial. Um, this is for the higher risk cancers, so not the very high risk cancers, which we, we believe may be no positive, but for patients, who have Gleason 4 plus 3 or 4 plus 4 T3As, not T3Bs, and PSAs between 15 and 30. So you have to have one, of, one or two of, of these characteristics. And they are randomized then between ADT plus SBRT, so it's six to nine months of ADT um, plus SBRT or six to nine months of ADT plus IGRT. And the study is currently uh, ran, uh, running and recruiting. So the current um, status of the trial, PACE A, the surgical one, is a difficult randomization, as is, um, and we've randomized 119 patients to date, and we're aiming to get that to uh, 200, no, 228. Um, so it is difficult, and unfortunately has been adversely impacted by COVID, 
as you can see here, this is the COVID effect. Although we were already behind target, the recruitment almost stopped completely um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, and hopefully now we will get back on track. Whereas Pace C is a different story. This is just a quick list of some of the hospitals. You can see the high numbers of people recruiting and 457 patients recruited to date and it's now recruiting at around about between um, 50 and 60 patients a month. So again, we had an impact of COVID. Most of the clinical trial activity uh, was delayed or stopped during the first phase of the pandemic. Um, and you can see that the line flattened, but now it's picking up. And I expect we will hopefully go over our accrual target. We did in pace B, we accrued, we accrued ahead of target. So pace A, we have nine centers open and 120 odd patients recruited. Pace B is close to recruitment and the acute toxicity has been analyzed and published in the Lancet Oncology. Um, we have actually now analyzed the two year toxicity which has been submitted to ESTRO as a late breaking abstract. So I expect we will be presenting that at ESTRO, hopefully live in Milan, um, if uh, everything goes according to plan. Um, and PACE-C is recruiting and 457 patients recruited so far. So this is the analysis of the acute toxicity, um, which as I say, we have uh, presented, I presented at GU ASCO and has been published in the Lancet by um, first author is Doug Brand gone through that. Um, and what we looked at was the worst G, uh, GU grade 2 RTOG toxicity in the first 12 weeks and the worst uh, GI grade 2 toxicity in the first 12 weeks. And these were pre-planned specified endpoints. So for GI toxicity, um, there was 12% um, versus 10% uh, for SBRT and um, no statistical difference between the two. This is what it looks like graphically. Um, the, the SPRT is in blue and the conventionally fractionated therapy in red, and this is the grade one. Um, so you, you do get grade one toxicity, but extremely low rates of grade two and very low, low rates of grade three. And you can see the grade two and three are completely overlapping with slightly earlier um, toxicity on the SPRT. For geronto urinary toxicity, Again, um, the, the rates were low. For grade one, 58% and grade for 58 versus um, 57. Importantly, what we're looking at was grade two, 25.8% um, grade two toxicity for conventionally fractured radi radiotherapy versus 20 for 20.8 for the SPRT. And again, there was no statistical difference, although it looked like SPRT was slightly lower, but not, sig not significant. Graphically, again comes on slightly earlier but no real difference the lines are close to overlapping even at one and two and three so i mean all that full data is published in full and as well as the patient reported which again showed no statistical difference um, and it's in in the lancet oncology and so it's in, uh, freely available so pace b has completed its recruitment and um, we expect we will have the acute toxicity at estra and hopefully the actual trial endpoint um, around this time in 2023, but so far, no statistic, statistical difference in acute toxicity in the pre-planned pre analysis. Importantly, the toxicity was lower than we actually expected in both arms of the study. So low and lower than we saw in the CHIP study. And we can only assume this is due to improved radiation planning techniques, because this was largely the same recruiting hospitals, many of the same doctors that recruited to the CHIP study, uh, recruited to the PACE study, but the technology has evolved in this time frame, and so we are assuming that the um, improvement in toxicity is a treatment delivery process. So how is prostate cancer research developed? And this is really what we've been doing in the UK with um, the RT01 was a dose escalation study um, over seven and a half weeks. And then there's the large, very large CHIP trial, um, which has become a UK standard of care and in many European and Canadian centers, um, four weeks is now the standard of care, uh, probably less so in the US, but, but definitely in parts of Europe and Canada. And now we've got the PACE trial, which um, may result in five fractions becoming standard of care. So where to next? Well, can we go lower uh, than five fractions? 
So there is already uh, some data um, on two fractions. This was not a randomized trial, but compared to the outcomes of, of, of patients treated with a two and a five fraction regime. And again, the results are tantalizing and encouraging, both for toxicity and disease outcome. So I think this is what we will probably need to test next. Um, and my colleague, Alison Tree, um, who's been involved in PACE from the start and is actually the CI of, uh, PI of the PACE C arm, um, has designed the HERMI study, which will open in spring to 2021. And this is comparing 36.25 in five versus 24 in two. All patients will be treated on the MR LIMAC and patients with a visible dominant lesion will get a boost to 27 gray. And if obviously if the HERMI study is um, positive, then this will move to a larger phase three randomized study. We did always wonder whether one fraction was the answer. And we've done planning studies um, looking at one fraction, in fact, had already designed the idea for a one fraction study, but I think we've fallen a bit out of love of, for the one fraction concept when we've seen an accumulation of brachytherapy data, which has really shown quite significantly worse disease outcomes um, for a single fraction treatment. And so it's not entirely clear why even doses up to 24 gray don't seem to be enough in one fraction. Um, so there must be elements of repopulation that, uh, that, that still require a degree of fractionation. Um, hard, to, hard to understand fully, but I think the data is pretty convincing from brachytherapy that, that a single fraction is not going to be the answer for prostate cancer. So we, will not, we won't be pursuing a single fraction at this stage. And that's where I'll stop. And um, apologies for the problems with the internet connection. I hope that we got there in the end. I'm absolutely certain that we made it to the end. Excellent. And thanks, Nicholas, for this fantastic overview, for this fantastic presentation. And um, everyone, you can ask your questions in the question answer functionality. And um, if we will not be able to answer all the questions, we will try um, to do that in a written format afterwards. Um, I would like to start with one question, then we can also go to the chat. Most of the data for prostate SBIT is based on low risk and favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. Why do you think, Nicholas, the, um, the um, data is less or the implementation of SBIT has been less for high risk patients? There we could something, we could win something. Is it the concerns about biology that the alpha beta ratio would be different? Is it the concerns about adding whole pelvis radiation? Is it the concerns how to integrate ADT? Is it the concerns about T3 um, tumors where you have larger target volumes, larger exposure of rectum and bladder? What is your opinion on that? So, yeah, I mean, you've kind of answered some of the question in the question. So I think it's it's multifactorial. So first of all, I think there was a, a particular concern about a, a different alpha-beta alpha ratio, although the evidence for that has been uh, unconvincing, really, that there's a different alpha-beta ratio for, for higher-grade cancers. The pro With T3B, you know, planning the whole seminal vesicle is definitely more challenging for SBRT, and they are more mobile. So you do need to require a larger margin and therefore the risk of toxicity goes up. And so the, I think confidence levels around treating the entire seminal vesicle, um, particularly early on, uh, were not there. And still, even now, you know, even in PACE C, we don't treat the whole seminal vesicle. We treat the possible one centimeter in the lower risk and, the, and, the, and two centimeters in the higher risks in PACE C. But we still don't treat the tips. We don't go right around. Um, I think the other thing for is the is the is the treatment of the pelvis. Uh, in our very high risk population, we've got the pivotal study, which is a randomised study between prostate alone and prostate and pelvis. So this is for the sort of Gleason four plus four T three B Gleason four plus fives, um, and that study is currently recruiting. It'll probably close recruitment um, later this year or early next year. Uh, uh, you know, I think there's still answers uh, uncertainty about the role of the pelvis but and people are very wedded to treating the pelvis or not treating the pelvis we've tended to treat a lot of pel uh, high-risk patients with pelvic radiotherapy so you know I, I wouldn't have been keen to treat this population with SBRT um, yet although we are looking um, at another study which we have a grant application in for which will be SBRT to the prostate with five fractions to the nodes versus SBRT to the prostate alone so um, I think there will be a role for SBRT in high-risk disease, 
I don't think that the biology um, will limit it. I think it's it's a toxicity question and a whether you need to treat the nodes question. So if you can treat the nodes safely, which I think you can, there is data from both India and Canada that you can do it in five fractions. Um, yeah, there will be a place for it, but currently I definitely wouldn't describe it as standard care. Another question in the chat, you mentioned the one fraction and results, and there has been the virtual prostatectomy data presented by Carla Grego, a single fraction of 24 gray. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so um, I, I think I've just reviewed a paper, I'm not sure if it's been published yet. So, um, I'm very unconvinced by the 24 gray. Uh, there's a very small study um, randomized, but when I say small, it's about 30 patients. Um, and even in that, the biochemical outcomes look concerning. Um, and I think we're gonna see a similar picture to the brachytherapy data. I don't, I can't understand why 24 gray isn't enough because you think it should be, um, but it, it doesn't seem that it is. So. I, I think we've, it, it, it's probably going to be a step too far, um, which is disappointing in some ways because the convenience of coming in and having your prostate cancer treated in a day, a sort of one-stop shop is always a utopia. Um, but I, I think we will, we will experiment with two fractions, but not yet one. There's two technical questions, which I would also like to ask. Um, how do you prescribe those in prostate cancer? Is it homogeneous or inhomogeneous as we do it in lung and liver metastasis? And the second technical question is about the use of rectal spaces. So, yeah, I mean, we, we prescribe on a, well, we prescribe on an isodose line. So generally with the cybernice, we're prescribing somewhere around 79, 80% isodose. And it's, it's a homogeneously planned technique, although the distribution in reality is still quite heterogeneous because of the delivery technique. Um, but we don't plan, which is another the, the other way where you actually completely sort of horseshoe sparing the urethra and doing it in four fractions, which is the heterogeneous plan is unique de de developed by, by Don Fuller. That's not a technique that we've used. So it's essentially, it's, it is homogeneous, but it, it, isn't, it isn't the same, same homogeneity you'd get with a linac. And the sorry, question, second question is about rectal spacer. So, um, we don't routinely use a rectal spacer. We have used, uh, used, used some in, sm in a small number of patients. I think um, it's one of those techniques which in theory is very attractive. Um, you know, you're separating the rectum from the prostate. However, there are unpleasant complications. They're rare, but when they happen, they're very serious. The data on rectal spaces is only one study. And in fact, the study was negative. It was only on a unplanned subgroup analysis that the study was positive. Um, so, and the actual control arm, the toxicity was uh, really bad. So I'm not convinced by the need for a rectal spacer, although equally, I think there's a logic to, to, to the sort of using it. So we are considering putting rectal spaces in the PACE-C study as an option, but they, we will mandate that if you use a rectal spacer in your center, you have to do it in both arms. So you can't use a rectal space with, you know, because otherwise it's not fair to compare when you're using a different, a totally different planning technique. Um, so you'd have to use a rectal space with your conventionally fractionated and your SBRT. Um, so I think we will have a cohort of, it, of rectal spaces in the PACE-C study um, before we finish. Okay, so um, also looking on the time, I think we have to finish the questions here and we will try to answer all questions in a written format. But let's um, look at the two cases that we asked before the symposium. Michael, can you please show the two cases and see whether we see any change of practice? Remember, we had a um, favorable intermediate risk patient, um, Gleason score 3 plus 4, um, two biopsies positive, Gleason score 8.76. Um, so what would be your preferred fraction inclusion? What would you propose to your patient? And the second patient was um, having a high risk prostate cancer, um, Gleason score eight, seven biopsies positive, PSA above 20. And there we also added the question for pelvis radiation. So please respond to the survey. Look at the results. You should now be able to see the results here. It's a bit small, 
But um, what fractionation would you propose to the low risk patient? There we have quite some change of practice. We have now predominance for the SBRT, voting with 57%. Second would be the CHIP trial with um, 34% and for 9% the conventional fractionation and going to the high risk patient. There is not so much change, which would be expected based on the presentation data we've seen. Uh, the preference would still be conventionally fractionated radiation complemented by whole pelvis radiation and ADT. Um, Nick, do you want to comment quickly? Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated actually. I, I, I'm also always cautious about saying it probably isn't yet standard of care, but uh, I think that's the way it'll head. So um, yeah, very well, an encouraging response. Okay, thanks, Nick. Excellent. Many thanks for your presentation. Apologies um, also on our side that the internet connection was a bit unstable. Yeah. Thanks for joining. We have one more presentation and then we would like to ask you for a final discussion at the end. Yeah. With that, I would like to hand over to Nicolas. We already had a couple of questions on how to and whether there might be a use and the benefit of MR guidance and adaptive radiotherapy. And that question will be addressed by Nicolas. Nicolas, please. Thank you very much, Matthias, for the introduction. I hope I can answer some of the questions I will be addressing soon. So my discussion tonight is about going beyond fractionation, really focusing on the techniques and here focusing on the MR guided adaptive radiotherapy of prostate cancer. But before I do that, I would like to look at what is the actual value of IGRT? And the question has image guided radiotherapy at all somehow influenced our patients outcomes? And Yes, I believe it has so, especially if I look at prostate cancer, uh, quite uh, old study already um, more than 30 years ago published, which looked at the, how, the, um, how the different methods of, well, initial skin marks, but then the different methods of image guidance affect the residual error. And you can clearly see that there was a tremendous uh, benefit uh, in the end, if you use image guidance, namely comb beam CT and fiducials implanted. And this has also been nicely investigated in a prospective randomized trial uh, where we clearly see a difference in the late rectal toxicity and also in the biochemical free uh, interval if we compare daily IGRT with the weekly IGRT group. And that's a very nice reassuring result. So if I look at the residual error with this comb beam CT and fiducial, uh, we might really ask the question, uh, even without MR guidance, we are already at a very good system in control if you look at positioning. But keep in mind that there are several other things to consider, but actually it's still an invasive method if you want the best um, IGRT with fiducials. And if we switch now to MRI guidance, it's not a very new theme as well, because as long as MRI has been available, uh, we have appreciated the better to soft tissue contrast. And this is one conceptual article already more than 20 years ago published. So it's nothing new, but what has really changed the game and the way we think uh, is that we now have machines available that integrate those technology, not only for diagnostic purposes and target volume definition, but also in our daily image guidance process. And if we look at the different machines, of course, they have different setup. They mainly separate themselves by different field strengths. What we cannot appreciate here from the slide, that there are also differences in how uh, the treatment planning and the patient positioning and treatment is tackled. Uh, but that's on a different page. The main difference here really being low field versus higher field MR guidance built in into a linear accelerator. And this gives us the possibility to really rethink MR guidance. So of course we have the target volume definition. Uh, we have the response assessment after treatment. And currently we still have patients set up in IGRT and use conventional Linux. And now we can add to that the MR guidance and especially the MR guidance and the online and continuous guidance during treatment because we don't have the radiation and 
<clears throat> this is just to illustrate how it uh, will change or might change already now, but in the future, if we omit the CT step, of course, we have the multi-parametric imaging uh, to detect uh, the prostate cancer itself, to maybe depict the dominant interprostatic lesion, but to have this transferred and registered to real MR images taken from a machine in treatment position and not going through the hassle to somehow adapt that to the CT geometry. And just to show the difference between low field and high field strengths, I think for these purposes, it works quite nicely. Now, uh, we can further go and rethink the MR guidance, not only for the target definition and for the positioning, but also for the daily adaptive stereotactic treatment. And now a uh, difference, uh, another situation comes into play uh, that we have not only the patient set up the MR guidance during the treatment, but that we really can do on-table adaptation. So as soon as the patient is positioned, we have acquired all the images, we can adapt all the contours we wish, and we can adapt the plan and replan to the daily anatomy. And of course, you have already seen those images. And that's uh, the major advantage if we are talking about adaptive, uh, just looking at the cone beam CT. And if we have to adapt uh, the contours based on that, it's getting quite difficult, of course. But there's another, um, an another subject be behind that, that Actually, if we look at the inter-observer variability between contouring on CT and MRI, MRI, we see significant differences. So even if we would improve CT uh, imaging on the um, Linux, uh, we still get into the situation. If we look at this uh, investigation, for example, quite some um, inter-observer variability shown by the yellow spots, especially in the seminal vesicle area and the ap apic apical area, which we are not very much surprised. So we can reduce this inter-observer variability uh, in, the, in the apex, and we can definitely improve it in the seminal vesicles. So that's the advantage of MR if you use it for daily image guidance. Now, this is a data taken from our own investigations, looking here at the motion in the 2D dimension, which we can continuously scan when we have the scene, I'm sorry, when we have the scene running. And you see that if the target is in the boundary, which is the red volume here, uh, we still have some residual error, but here you can see considerable more motion, and this would be without the respective guidance and gating, uh, which is MR guided here, and which you can nicely see that suddenly there's bowel movement and the prostate moves out of the tracking boundary and the machine stops treatment. So we can, uh, with online adaptation, really guide, uh, the, guide the beam and increase or reduce the residual um, error. Of course, this is possible on the patient individual level. So on a whole population, maybe this effect may be not that impressive, but on an individual patient level, we can see quite a lot of changes. And this is nicely depicted here that now it is, we are able to discern what dose is definitely is delivered to the patient and two examples where the dose nicely fits to what has been planned initially, but also a case where it does not. And with this adaptive, if we now are able to sum up the doses from fraction to fraction, we do not only deliver the plan of the day, but also we can correct for the coverage. Uh, another interesting thing, what we observed is these are uh, 10 patients um, we followed uh, where we saw over the course of five fraction SBRT, uh, the prostate actually increases in volume and it was observed in up to 25% increase in the prostate volume, and especially we had to adapt in the dorsal zone where we uh, most often encounter the tumors. And also very um, important, is it stable? Because we have some table time. How stable are the organs over time if it takes us 30 minutes to adapt and then to irradiate? And we checked that over a period of 60 minutes. And what we realized, if we stay in within 45 minutes of adaptation and treatment time, actually the recovery stays pretty safe and we can accomplish uh, daily adaptation. So again, in patients where we see these changes, there is a benefit 
uh, uh, from a dosimetric perspective. But can we also do good plans in 10 minutes? Normally it takes of, uh, hours to get good plans. We looked at that. And actually it's very interesting to see that we have good plans, that the quality stays good. And we also investigated this for prostate, which is important for the talk here. So yes, we are able to achieve good plans in that time and good adapted plans. If we now look at the clinical data that's available, of course it's scarce because it's a very, very young technology. And I separated out uh, more or less feasibility studies that have looked at what is the actual effect, what is the effect of dos on dosimetry. Uh, and there a benefit could be seen, but be careful some of those studies uh, used hydrogel spacers. So an invasive procedure again, uh, where we actually would expect that if we can adapt to the daily anatomy, we would not need those spacers. But we also have early toxicity data. And that's also very reassuring these doses we know from what has just been presented. And the toxicity is more or less in the range what we would expect from SBRT. Now, of course, we would expect to do, to do better. So we need to investigate to reduce margin to really see the effect. And that's very nicely um, done by this study from the UCLA, where, we, where they really want to compare SBRT um, CT guided, the way we're doing it right now, to an MR guided SBRT approach in a one-to-one -one fashion. And they will look at uh, the primary endpoint of early acute GU toxicity, and they hope a reduction by 50% which is quite ambitious, but I think this is a way to go to evaluate such a technology. But also I believe we can, be, can go beyond with this technology because we have this imaging and we need to go for an approach where we do not only pre therapeutically look at what we consider the relevant lesion or the dominant lesion or the radiomics feature lesion, but we can do that on, on the course of the treatment. And maybe we find uh, distinct spots and changes over the time where we can improve in the future and maybe even adapt along the course of such an SBRT treatment. Uh, currently, we adapt on the anatomy of the, of the organs at risk and the prostate, but hopefully we can adapt soon on the dominant lesion, but in the future, even better on the relevant areas we may distinguish with quantitative image analysis. And with this, I would like to end my talk and give the conclusion that, of course, we have optimal visualization in treatment position with this machine. We can visualize that online and really verify online. Uh, we can monitor that uh, with real-time uh, CNA imaging, which gives us much more confidence. And the beauty is this repetitive imaging we can do over time, which gives us the possibility to really adapt. And that's already re uh, reality. Biologic adaptive, maybe not yet, but very nicely, we can now fully um, establish a 40 dose calculation and see how this affects uh, really our doses we deliver and also the organs at risk doses. And hopefully a dream, we can really foster those uh, response prediction. Uh, that's a dream, but I think it's not all is a promise, but it's a big, big, big opportunity. And I think one of those three or two of those three checkboxes we have already ticked. So hopefully we will tick a few more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikolaus, for this excellent presentation. There's one question which I would like to ask the both of you, Nikolaus and Nick. Um, what is the total treatment time. So how long is the patient on the couch? And we have the um, nice situation here that we have a URA and elector user. So Nicholas, do you want to start from the elector perspective? 40, 45 minutes. Okay, 40, 45. Nick? Well, actually it's uh, around um, the same number. It just depends whether it's fully adaptive or whether anatomy fits nicely and we can do it in a more or less non-adaptive way or we only need a weight optimization. Um, the, the, the largest part currently or the most uncertainty is really uh, the contour adaptation. Uh, of course, prostate is easier in the abdomen. It gets a little more complicated because we also need uh, to, to contour all the density overrides, air overrides. Um, but that can be quite quick. So it depends whether we go fully or 
non non fully adaptive. We've heard that adaptation might be much quicker on um, on new systems using cone beam imaging and the ether system. So what and where do you think we could accelerate the adaptive process in particular to also reach a time slot of 15 or 20 minutes? And Nick, what is your opinion where we need to advance to come down from this 40, 45, 50 minutes? Yeah, I think there's multiple. So it's quite um it's quite user, you know, intensive at the moment. You need, you know, you need a research fellow or a doctor there. I mean, once we have the algorithms properly sorted, that this is a truly um, adaptive process that doesn't require human to do it in real time in any way, that will speed it up dramatically. But we're not there yet. So this is, you know, this is a, it's really exciting, but it's early days. Um, but I think it's it's probably the area for me with the prostate and the MRNA we should focus on the most because you know trying to prove its role in sort of phase three randomized studies like we did with chip or pace is going to be really difficult to do in in any any kind of realistic time frame because the scarcity of the machines and um, how long it actually will take. So I think what we have to focus on is is the adaptive area and the you know, and, and using the diffusion weighting, for instance, to actually target the areas of interest within the gland. That, that to me is the most exciting bit for prostate. Okay, now we're almost five minutes past six. Um, I would like to thank you, Nick, again, for joining our symposium, for giving an excellent presentation, also for joining our discussion. Also, thank you to you, Nikolaus, for um, the excellent presentation on MR guidance. Just to wrap up um, what we've heard today, we have seen quite reassuring data for favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer patients that high fraction SPLT might be or is an option which we can offer in clinical routine, but still with the lack of large randomized phase three data supporting the promising data which we have seen both in terms of early and late toxicity and also in terms of efficacy. We have less data for unfavorable intermediate and even less start for high-risk prostate cancer patients. There we need stronger evidence. In terms of how to combine SBRT with something we know, for example, ADT, there's no signal that SBRT changes the biology of prostate cancer. So most likely ADT will remain an important component of our treatment. Then coming to technology, there's new technologies on the horizon which might make SBRT or hyperfractionation even more safe maybe going down to two fractions. One fraction, there's still some concerns based on the data we've seen um, in for, both for EBRT and for brachytherapy. With that, I would like to thank you for joining our symposium and would also like to remind you um, on our next week where we will um, discuss pancreatic cancer, again, addressing the question of SBRT in this Cancer side, Professor Maria Hawkins, also from London. I wish everyone an excellent and nice summer evening. Enjoy the sun outside and looking forward to week and see you next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks for time. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Bye bye.